Bienvenue, nous, allo, and welcome. I have the video for this week, and this week we are having a look at a very, 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 très, très, très famous uh, horror novella. It is, it is so famous, mais I do not think that you have read it. Even though you totally, totally know it, and I had not read it yet, uh, so I, uh, I, I, I actually was a little surprised when I read it. So, but before we start, remember there is a shop where we have books and writing services, and uh, there is a red bubble shop where we have très joli designs. Over a hundreds of them, they are très jolie. You will find something I'm sure that you would like. So if you want to support us, that is how you support us. If you would like to support us without us without having to spend any money, like, subscribe, comment, share, all of those things help to support uh, these videos. So what are we having a look at today? We are having a look at a very, very famous Scottish novella by Robert Louis Stevenson, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I know it is, it is only 70 pages and I know I said the Scottish me because Robert Louis Stevenson is a Scottish writer, even though this is not set in Scotland. Me, we uh, we will discuss uh, that as we go. So, the strange case of Doctor Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. It is one of possibly the most filmed horror story. Is one of the most famous horror stories. Uh, I, I, I just watched uh, Bugs Bunny do uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, called the Hyde and Hair. It honestly, it is six minutes long and, uh, and it's, it, it, it has the uh, consciousness that is in the public of what is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, there are films of this, of this story going back to the early, early days of the silent film. In fact, in 1920, there were two films by two different production companies of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, I will have a, I wanted to watch the uh, John Barrymore, so I will link that down below. Uh, so it is, it is a story that has captured people's imagination for ever since this was written. Me is it exactly the story that you think it is? That is a bit that makes it very interesting. Basque, because I think that we all know this story by reputation, not from the original text. So, what is the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Uh, it was a shilling shocker. It was published, is it very short? It was published uh, in... Uh, 1886, we oui, 1886, and uh, it tells the story of a uh, Dr. Jekyll, but it is does not tell this from his perspective. It tells the story from the perspective of a friend of Dr. Jekyll's, a Mr. Utterson. Mr. Utterson, he is a friend of Dr. Jekyll's and he and his friend uh, his, and his cousin are walking and they see a door of a blank faced door, no windows on the street side and nobody has bothered to clear away urchins or anything else. And they discuss this door and Mr. Utterson's friend, uh, cousin, uh, Mr. Enfield, uh, Mr. Utterson and Mr. Enfield uh, discuss the... Mr. Enfield had seen um, a man emerge... Uh, it has actually seen the man who, who has come in and out of that door. He is a man who he saw late one evening at uh, in the early hours of the morning barreling down the street and he trampled over a small child who was running crossways 
So he was going this way and the child was going this way and they met and this man who it trampled all over this child and would have kept, uh, would have kept going. May the cries come up as uh, the child had gone for the doctor. So the doctor arrives, the child was more shocked than actually hurt. Uh, may the family were a poor family and uh, in order to hush up, what happened they basically blackmail him into giving them a hundred pounds and he goes in there because mr enfield had actually collared the man and dragged him back and in order to not create scandal he says okay i'll give them monies and he comes back with 10 pound in coin and a check for 90 pound Mr. Enfield is shocked to see the name on the check and he is curious about this and he uh, insists on staying with the man till the bank's open to cash the check because he, uh, Pasqui, he does not believe the man has uh, got this check by any uh, correct means. Or oh, that it might be a fraud, some, something like that. Uh, he cashes the check and Mr. Utterson and so the family gets the hundred pounds. But Mr. Utterson is, when he returned home, he is a lawyer and he pulled out the will of his friend, Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll is supposedly leaving all his estate, should he die or disappear, to a Mr. Edward Hyde. The man who trampled on the child is Mr. Edward Hyde. He is younger, smaller, and it is repeatedly said throughout the uh, story that Mr. Hyde looks deformed. Now, this is a very uh, Victorian concept. Uh, I think that as it got turned into film, the idea of deformed became monstrous and the makeup department of various films had great fun in turning him into monster. May, especially Bug Bunny, he got long arms and green and red eyes, horrible monster. So, uh, it, but May, uh, Hyde is not physically monstrous. The, the, the question of a sense, is there is no obvious physical deformity of height. It is this sense of deformity. Now, this is a Victorian story, and the Victorians had some very peculiar notions of beauty and deformity. They saw uh, beauty as a virtuous thing, that a beautiful person was innately virtuous, and they saw that a person with physical deformity or ugliness was seen as bad. This was an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly terrible, superficial, judgmental, appalling thing, which is part of the reason why Victorians are so awful. Uh, may the, you get this word deformed repeatedly through the story. Uh, in relation to height and it's not we can see is that uh, they feel something emanating from him it is a very peculiar um, point that happens so as uh, the mr hyde is it turns out that the the blank faced uh, uh street front is actually the back door of dr jacker's laboratory that is where Dr. Mr. Hyde has been going into. And it is only when Utterfield goes round to Dr. Jekyll's house, which is literal, which backs onto this street, that he realizes, oh, that is Jekyll's laboratory. There is some connection between this Hyde and, and my friend, Dr. Jekyll. He has also seen another friend who he has fallen out who has fallen out with Jekyll on a matter of scientific things. We are not explained about that particularly, uh, though it appears to be on the experimental end. Most of the story we see from Utterson's point of view. Most of the story. Um, Utterson uh, is Hyde, the concept, uh, the, the, the person of Hyde 
uh, disappears for a while. Uh, when Utterson, Utterson does become somewhat uh, obsessed with seeing height and he corners him when he is going to go into the laboratory and gets his address from him. And again, he sees him and is like, oh, he's horrible. Uh, may he is, um, so he has this this Imi, he has the idea of who Hyde is and he knows where Hyde lives in Soho. Now, uh, one of the things about this story is that uh, the geography does not work in London. May the geography work much better in Edinburgh than in London. May uh, Stevenson moves the story to London because um, the idea of presentation and importance of maintaining face was so, is so much more important in London. So there is that. That is why the geography is all messed up and uh, the river doesn't make sense. A whole lot of things do not make sense. Part of the reason he had initially sought to use Edinburgh is that Edinburgh is across the river is seen as a very divided city. The poor section and the wealthy section is much more uh, defined in Edinburgh than it is in London. So uh, Hyde, uh, uh, Utterson goes and visits uh, Dr. Jekyll Dr. Jekyll is, he has been, he's, he's always been uh, upset about this uh, contra, uh, this will. Um, he does see Mr. Poole, uh, who is a butler. Uh, may, um, he, he, he does not, uh, he, he, Dr. Jekyll is not uh, particularly worried about this height at all. May then, height kill a man. So a little while later, Hyde is seen murdering an MP in the poor part of town at about 3 a.m. or very early hours of the morning. Now, nobody actually stops to ask the question, uh, what was the Lord MP Kalu, whatever his name is, doing in the poor part of London? at that time and why did he say to Hyde to provoke him into murder we never know me i think i think that uh, that's the mp i think that the mp was cruising in the poor part of london and i think because pasky because Hyde is a younger man and looks poor and looks uh, depraved. I think that the Lord confused him for a rent boy and they saw in rage height that he beat him to death. That is my theory. I think that it fits very well. So this, uh, uh, this, he beat this man to death. A very, very, Très, très, très vicious beating, well over and above just robbery or something. It is just truly beat him to death, <clears throat> beat him to, to pulp. And he is seen by a, uh, a, a, a maid who has already seen Hyde. So she knows she is able to tip him off as that is Hyde. That is Edward Hyde. Utterson becomes involved because uh, Pasquier, he identifies the body and he gives him uh, Hyde's address. He also recognizes the broken cane that was used in the murder. Part of the cane has been left, other part has been taken by Hyde and he recognizes the cane as a cane that he had himself given to Dr. Jekyll. So he is, he is beginning to wonder what is this Hyde? Is this Hyde blackmailing his friend? What is happening? This is a very bad man to be associated with. Why is he willing away his fortune? Is this man going to murder his friend in order to get the fortune? He does not know. He does not know if Hyde is aware that he is uh, to inherit uh, Dr. Jekyll's fortune. Dr. Jekyll is an older man. So he is now a very afraid for his friend. 
after the murder, Dr. Jekyll becomes instantly a lot more sociable and Hyde disappear. They had gone to uh, the police and um, Utterson had gone to Hyde's uh, address where they found the uh, various things all packed up or you know, very hurriedly thrown around. Um, his checkbook is burned um, and anything that could identify him has been taken away. But the other half of the cane is there. The other half is a murder weapon. So, uh, after this, Jekyll become very much more sociable. He start to visit his friends, but that abruptly stops. And one of his other friends, Doctor Layton, suddenly gets a very peculiar. He suddenly becomes very, very ill. Like very ill, the, he 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 is, is. All these people are older men, uh, men in their fifties, sixties. They are not young men. May uh, Doctor Layton suddenly become incredibly ill, and he die. And he gives a letter to Mister Utterson. We do not see the contents of the letter. Not long after this, Paul comes to Utterson to tell him about that he's very frightened for his master. He is locked in the laboratory and he will not he will not come out and he is very he is afraid that he is being murdered by Hyde. They know Hyde is in there. But they think that there are two men in there. Especially since they had alternately hear two voices, the voice of Hyde and the voice of Jekyll. So this is this is what uh, comes in. They break down the door, Utterson, and they find Hyde dead. It is presumed that Jekyll has been either murdered or has uh, has has disappeared. There is no idea what has happened to him until they find a packet that Dr. Jekyll has left a document and the end of the story we read both of the documents, Dr. Layton's letter and Dr. Jekyll's uh, letter, both of which explain the extraordinary scientific thing of Dr. Jekyll's transformation, physical bodily transformation into Hyde and the fact that Dr. Jekyll had uh, had what had initially been a very conscious transformation has started to become unconscious and involuntary and the portion will not hold him. And now he is he is flicking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and he's been desperately trying to concoct a new portion to stop this transformation. Uh, so, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, may Reading it, it is very interesting how much different it is from the concept that we have of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it is also interesting how much, as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is the Peter Dorian Gray. Peter Dorian Gray rips this off absolutely. Absolutely. Peter Dorian comes after and he, Oscar Wilde rips the whole thing off with a picture instead of a potion. This is a urban gothic novel and the, the, the curious quality of it, uh, if it was a straight gothic novel, like a straight 18th century gothic, traditional gothic novel, then Mr. Hyde would be blackmailing Dr. Jekyll. It would be straight up that any of the spooky stuff would be instantly explained with rationality. May because this is a 19th century uh, uh, gothic novel, this is actually more like uh, Dracula or that German one that we had a look at a few weeks ago, the Scamillo Padalus. Uh, which absolutely has no, because it was only just um, translated into English in 2019. So, but it, by the 19th century, you have a different focus for the Gothic. The Gothic in the 18th century is 
very spooky story but with a rational ending. By the 19th century, by the late 19th century, which is what this, this book is, late 19th century, 1880s, the supernatural is starting to creep in and also the psychological. Why does Dr. Jekyll concoct this potion? Dr. Jekyll confesses he concocts this potion because he, he has dark desires that he cannot uh, let loose easily. He, he, is, he is repressing a side of himself, what he calls his evil side. I like to think that his evil side is just plain vanilla sex. I really do. I really do like to think that that he has gone to all this bazaar and all this pain and all this suffering and all this chaos for plain vanilla sex. Basque, it would it would uh, coincide with um with the the uh, repressed Victorians <laughs> if it was if he did all this bazaar for plain vanilla sex. It's like seriously, man. Go and just go and get a wife. Um, uh, that is one of the interesting things. None of these men have wives. So it is clearly something sexual. Whether it is plain vanilla heterosexual sex or whether it is um, gay sex, we don't know. So I think if it were gay sex, he would not have beaten to death the MP. I think it is plain vanilla sex. Maybe as a kink. Maybe he likes to have someone dress up as a schoolman and spank him. I don't know, but something. I do not actually believe that this is Marquis de Sade material. I think that uh, Dr. Jekyll does not strike me as somebody who is a secret sadist um, or even a secret masochist. It is not uh, Venus in Furs or the Marquis de Sade. I think he is doing this for plain vanilla sex. Anyway, uh, this is very... Uh, very Victorian in that concept of repression. It is very much uh, more psychological in terms of the modern modern times. Uh, we have no concept of exactly what it is that his secret passion is. In earlier drafts, apparently Stevenson did make it more obvious that it was a sexual thing that he wished. Uh, so it is it is it is in this world of repression. May one of the things that struck me as I read this is how different it is to an English book. Although it is set in London, it is not the characters themselves are not actually English. And I, I it's the things that makes me think they are not terribly English is actually the number of references to religious text or voluntarily reading religious text. Multiple characters do this. Utterfield does this. Um, Hyde, when he is in the laboratory, trapped in his laboratory, he um, writes dirty things all over Jekyll's Bible to distress Jekyll when Jekyll returns. Um, you do not see in English novels people reading, unless it is something like uh, The Vicar of Wakefield, very obviously a vicar or uh, character. You do not see characters reading spiritual texts. And I think this partly leads into the repression quality of this story in that the the austerity of the religions that developed in Scottish in the Scottish world, the heavily Calvinist things of the of the Methodist and whatnot, these religions of the book are also religions that are very très, très, très repressive. They are religions of the idea of appearance, salvation, salvation being already um, decided at a predestination um, and the idea that one must 
live a pure life in the hopes that one is predestined to 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 be to go to heaven and not be damned so this i think is partly what is motivating jekyll is 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 not only the desire to engage in the wicked vanilla sex that he wishes to have but also i think that his uh, religious upbringing, his, his auster the austerity of um, the Scottish world that Stevenson knows, but does not work so well in an English context. You do not see this same sort of thing in Dickens, although you see plenty of very bad men and women in Dickens. You do not see this austerity of spirituality, austerity of life in English stories. This is, a, uh, I think, a very Scottish uh, character. Uh, likewise, the, the inability to live with the, the straight up hypocrisy of Victorians, of the fine gentlemen who go and visit the numerous prostitutes of uh, London is not, um, is not something that seems to, although we concern the English, is, is, it doesn't seem to create this moral dilemma that it creates for Jekyll, which gives it that heavily Scottish, repressive feel uh, which I think comes from the particular strain of religion. It's also very, um, Jekyll himself is a very Faustian character. He, he is here making a deal with the devil. He is creating this potion so that he can both engage in licentious behavior and be morally upstanding and pure. Basque, it is very interesting. I did not know until I read the book because it is something um, that is not made very obvious in popular culture is that Jekyll is entirely aware of every single thing that Hyde does. Not only aware, he enjoy being Hyde. He enjoy, he had let out the monster that he has inside and he enjoy it, which is why he keep taking the potion. He is voluntarily taking it and he is managing a degree of disassociation is that Hyde does those things. I am a morally pure person and that is what makes him very uh, Faustian. This is how the devil gets your soul. The devil gets your soul by giving you what you want. Faust is caught in the web of the devil and the trickery of Mephistopheles and Jekyll is caught in the web and the trickery of his disavowing and disassociating Hyde from himself. And that is, it is actually, it is really fascinating and that there are two, the first two times he references turning into Hyde involuntarily is one in sleep, which makes me very much suspect Hyde is, is sexual repression because he was asleep and he wakes up as Hyde. The second one, he is in the park and he has been not being Hyde for some time. And he, as this is after the murder and he is sitting in the park and he is thinking how very, very proud he is of having restrained that part of himself. And what do they say? What do they say? Pride cometh before the fall and boom, he turned into Hyde in the middle of the park. Hyde keeps getting more powerful the more he is fed and the more Jekyll thinks he is proud of himself to have solved his problem. Jekyll would be much, much, much happier if he could be a whiskey priest. If he could have his problems and still try to be good. But no, no. Jekyll wishes to be virtuous and just hive off that part of himself. And it turns out that his attempts to do this actually cause his downfall and cause Hyde to become the dominant side of his personality. Who is the monster here? Jekyll is the monster.
Jekyll is a monster, much like uh, Frankenstein, who is a monster. Well, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, obviously, is a monster. Uh, the creature is an innocent that is, is responding to the treatment that is received. Hyde is a non-integrated shadow that Jekyll has rejected. And of course, if you don't integrate your shadow, what happened? He go amok. He really could have done with some Jungian analysis. He would have been much happier as a whiskey priest. Much, much happier to be a whiskey priest. Uh, at least uh, slightly healthier than what he is doing. And I think uh, it is interesting that um, in the Bugs Bunny, the last frame of Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny accidentally, uh, Bugs Bunny doing the potion and he turned into the, the monster's hide version of Bugs Bunny, but his, uh, his personality is exactly the same because uh, Bugs Bunny know he a little stinker. He know he a little stinky. He he had no change in personality because he integrated whole. He is well aware of what his shadow is. He is the trickster god. The trickster god does not uh, turn into a monster. He might transform physically, but he, uh, he, he has his shadow fully integrated. He's a little stinker. But, um, I think one of the other things now that we talked completely about the book, I was thinking as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about where is it, one of the big themes of this book is the concept of who are you when you are alone, when nobody can see you, when, when there is no scrutiny of who you are. That is who you truly are. And are you a person who if given a portion, would remain yourself? Or would you become Eid? And uh, it has taken over a hundred years, but we have a portion. We have a portion and we see people letting hide out. It's called the internet and anonymity on the internet. How many people have who would otherwise think themselves perfectly upstanding, moral, right-leaning citizens who would never dream of attacking a person in real life where they would face the actual consequences of their actions, attack strangers behind the anonymity of the internet. How many of us are hide? And how many of us are bugs? How many of us uh, are still ourselves when offered the temptation of anonymity and an ability to indulge our worst traits? How many of us are comfortable with our worst traits? It is in this way very much like the Australian Gothic is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. How many of us, without the restraining bolts of society, would run amok? Well, well, no, actually a lot of people. There are a lot of people. It is kind of scary. People who would never do this, may in, in real life, do this every day behind a computer screen. May I think that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde have a message for these people is, the more that you indulge hide, the more that you indulge that part of you rather than integrate it, the more that it becomes the dominant part of your personality and the risk that you will no longer be able to just be hide anonymously, that it will start to bleed into your, your regular life. Dr. Jekyll never returns at the end of the book. He, Hyde does not become Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll has become fully consumed by Hyde, by his worst possible traits. He is never redeemed. There is no... Even, even his final confession is not a confession. There is an element of face saving. There is no mea culpa, mea culpa. You know, no, I am at fault. I have done this that would help him to reintegrate his, uh, his, his, his identity. And I think that this is also one of the uh, reflections of the austere Scottish re religion. There is no um, 
among uh, certainly certain uh, certain sects of Protestantism, there is no concept of confession, of of being able to say I did this and I am sorry and I am remorseful. It it is not a part of that culture, and so even even his final confession is not. Uh, it is not remorseful in some ways. He has no way of being remorseful. He is entirely consumed by Hyde, and that is why Jekyll never returns. Jekyll may have grown horrified at what he is, but he is, he is so unable to show genuine remorse. He is proud of what he has achieved to a degree, even to the end. There is a level of pride in that, which is why he cannot not be hide. He has, uh, he, he, even his escape, his escape, his killing himself as the door is broken down, is a source of pride for him. Was he, before he did that, was he Jekyll or was he Hyde? He could have been Jekyll, take the poison, but the body is Hyde. So that I think becomes interesting is if you indulge rather than integrate your dark side, how quickly until that takes entirely and you can no longer hide it from the world outside. So Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it is very much interesting to see this 19th, the late 19th century, you see stories that are picking up on the concepts of psychology that are coming through. They are, um, they are, they are very interesting. The Gothic of this period is very interesting. It has more of the supernatural in it. Uh, and it is also a story that although you think you know it, you don't fully know it. So I would highly recommend it. You can read it in an evening or an afternoon. It's 70 pages. It rips along. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I will see you again another time. Au revoir. If you would like to support this channel, come across to the Black Hockey Press website, www.blackhockeypress.com.au, where you will find books and other writing services to help with your writing. <laughs>